Welcome to our plenary session. My name is uh, Alan Abelson. I'm a family doctor in Toronto and, uh, and part of the uh, working party on the environment with Wonka. It's my absolute pleasure today to introduce uh, the plenary speaker, uh, Professor Sir Andy Andrew Haynes, um, who's going to talk about safeguarding human health in a time of environmental change. Um, perhaps Andy's uh, greatest credential is that he was uh, co-founder of our Working Party on the Environment in 1995 at a meeting of Wonka in Hong Kong, where he and I uh, started the Working Party. But let me talk about his broader commitment to this uh, discipline. Uh, he was uh, Dean of the uh, school, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and is Professor of Environmental Change and Public Health there. And I won't go into great details about his, his role there. He was a a general practitioner in North London for, for many, many years. And more recently, his uh, work in terms of climate change uh, is he was a member of the uh, UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the working uh, uh, group that worked on the health effects. So a, a very, very influential uh, uh, policy work and, and gathering the evidence for the second and third assessment reports and the fifth uh, assessment report. Um, and importantly, he chaired the, in 2014-15, the Rockefeller Foundation with the, together with the Lancet Commission, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet Commission produced a commission on planetary health that was published and really was the, is the founding, uh, document for the whole movement of planetary health. So I want to, with uh, great respect, uh, introduce uh, uh, Andy to uh, talk about safeguarding human health in the time of environmental change. Thank you, Andy. Well, thank you so much. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to speak to you today. Uh, and my title is about how we can safeguard human health in the face of multiple environmental changes. As we've seen in just the last week or so, uh, we've been uh, very much engaged, of course, in, in climate change uh, and health with COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, and uh, that's really brought to the collective consciousness of the world the importance of addressing one of these changes, which is climate change. So in my talk, I'm going to draw on some of the work we did a few years ago on the Commission on Planetary Health, but also uh, I'm going to focus particularly on climate change as uh, the main example of these uh, multiple environmental changes that are confronting uh, humanity. So my first slide really illustrates the scale of the challenges and people have called this the great acceleration because it's acceleration in terms of the human impact on the environment. And on the left, you can see the socioeconomic trends that are driving these changes in the, in the world's environment, the global environment. World population has increased, uh, of course, dramatically, particularly since the middle of the last century. The economic uh, enterprise, the global economic enterprise has increased also very markedly since the middle of the last century. So real uh, global GDP is now, the slide was made a few years ago, it's, it's well above 70 trillion, of course. Energy use has increased. It's been powering the economic growth, which has resulted in, in human progress. We've seen increases in urbanization now with the majority of the world's population living in cities. In order to grow the food to feed this uh, world population, of course, there's been an increase in, in fertilizer production and consumption. We've dammed about 60% of the world's uh, rivers in order to to irrigate the land and to generate hydroelectricity. And many other uh, changes have occurred as well as illustrated on the left side of this slide. So we have seen genuine progress. We've seen reductions um, in poverty, absolute poverty has reduced, although of course there's still a lot of inequ inequity around the world. And in some countries inequities have actually been increasing, particularly as a result um, of, of COVID. We've seen a, an increase in, in life expectancy of over 20 years since the middle of the last century, although, of course, COVID has, has um, resulted in some countries in a, in a reduction in life expectancy in the last year or two. 
But this progress, this inequitable progress, has come at a cost, and the cost has been borne by the Earth systems. And that's shown on the right side here. You can see how greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, which is a long-lived greenhouse gas, have accumulated in the atmosphere. It's the most important of the greenhouse gases. About 70% of, of the heating so far has been due to carbon dioxide. And of course, about 15% or more of it stays up in the atmosphere for a thousand years or more. We don't know how to get it out in a kind of cost-effective and efficient way at the moment. So that's a legacy we're leave, leaving to future generations. But other gases as well, methane, which is a short-lived uh, climate pollutant, very, very uh, uh, contributes substantially to, to global heating. Uh, that's also increased as a result of changes in land use, increased uh, livestock, gas leaks, and, and so on. Many other Earth system trends are shown on this slide. I won't read them all out, but you can see that our oceans are becoming more acidified. The temperature of the planet's now warmed 1.2 degrees centigrade uh, we've reached now since pre-industrial time. So there's already been a lot of heating of the Earth's um, uh, surface. We know that the heating has been more over the land than over the oceans, and some parts of the planet have warmed up quicker than others. The Arctic, for example, has heated up more quickly than uh, than much of the planet. And we've uh, exploited uh, really about 40% of the world's uh, land to grow food. And so there's really a limit. We, we can't really exploit any more of the land, particularly if we want to protect biodiversity loss. And we're now, many uh, scientists have suggested we're moving into the sixth great extinction where we're losing biodiversity at an unprecedented rate. Perhaps, perhaps uh, 100, it's a hundredfold or perhaps more uh, times greater than pre-human existence. So what we're seeing then is we have some genuine, although inequitable progress, but that's now threatened by the undermining, the damage to the Earth systems, which ultimately, of course, our health depend on these vital Earth systems. So this has led to the concept of planetary boundaries advanced by Johan Rockström, Will Steffen and colleagues. And this is a paper they wrote in 2015, which shows us uh, these, describes, outlines these different planetary boundaries ranging from climate change, biosphere integrity, land system change, freshwater use, nitrogen and phosphorus flows, acidification of the ocean, loading of the atmosphere with aerosols causing air pollution and so on, depletion of, of ozone, the high level ozone, the stratosphere that protects us against ultraviolet light. That's the one good bit of good news that that does seem to have stopped and the ozone hole is, is healing to some extent. And then novel entities, lots of chemical pollutants, uh, many of which we don't understand the full cost, uh, consequences of those uh, pollutants. So you can see these very widespread changes that are, are impacting on human health now and will increasingly affect human health in the future. I'm going to focus particularly on climate change, but against the background of these multiple environmental changes, which interact in ways that we don't fully yet uh, understand. So this just this slide just illustrates how these multiple factors uh, can affect uh, undernutrition. So here are the pressures on the left side here, everything from freshwater use, land use change, climate change, and, and, and so on, overfishing. Uh, and these are how they affect these um, states like uh, the, the climate rainfall temperature, uh, extreme storms, and so on, sea level rise. Uh, air pollutants like ground level ozone, not to be confused with the stratospheric ozone, which is high up in the atmosphere and protects us against ultraviolet light. Ground level ozone is damaging to health and to crops, soil and so on. And these affect um, loss of biodiversity. Pollinators are very important for many crops and they obviously influence food plant diversity. The content, the nutrient content, as we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, the nutrient content of many crops declines. So all of these factors result in declining crop yields, declining nutritional quality of crops, uh, reductions in fishery product, um, uh, uh, fisheries and uh, seafood. And all of this can increase the risk, of course, of, of undernutrition. Apple crops and um, obviously fruit and vegetables as well. And we know that the causes of this degradation, much at least certainly in terms of climate change, um, are very um, inequitable. So the richest 10% of the world's population are responsible for almost half of the total uh, consumption related carbon dioxide emissions, whereas the poorest 50% are responsible for only about 10%. So there's a profound issue 
of climate justice here. Those populations that are going to suffer the most from climate change are least responsible for the emissions that have caused climate change. And that's something we, we need to bear into, in mind when thinking about the challenges of climate change. Now, climate change has a range of impacts on, on human health. They're summarized in this slide, this rather complex slide, but let me take you through it quickly. So these greenhouse gases cause rising temperature, rising sea levels, increasing extreme weather events. And through many demographic and socioeconomic and other environmental factors, these, these moderate or modulate the way in which climate change impacts on, on human health. Um, and the, some of those are summarized in, in the slide. The, the climate change then affects a range of different exposure pathways. There are these very direct pathways like extreme heat stress, for example, uh, storms, extreme storms, uh, floods, droughts, wildfires. And these all affect uh, human health through a range of pathways here. Uh, heat is an obvious impact, but also air quality. Wildfires affect air quality, of course. Water quality and quantity affecting a whole range of infectious diseases here in freshwater systems, but also to some extent in the oceans as well, these harmful algal blooms. Uh, food supply and safety, as I've already mentioned, these can affect undernutrition, but also increasing the risk of food poisoning and other diseases related to um, contamination of food chains. Vector-borne diseases like malaria at the edges of the distribution or dengue, or other vector-borne diseases here. And then these impacts that are mediated through socioeconomic systems like increasing poverty, displacement or migration of populations, and increasing conflict probably as well. So you can see the effects are quite complex, mediated through a range of pathways. Um, and it's likely that some of these indirect effects will be at least as important, perhaps more important, than some of the more direct pathways. So increasingly, um, thanks to advances in science, we can detect and attribute the health impacts of climate change to human-induced climate change. So they're not due to natural variability. We can increasingly separate the natural variability from the human-induced climate change. And this image on the left here shows you what the climate would look like without anthropogenic or human-induced climate change, which is along the bottom here, and with a climate change, human-induced climate change. And you can see that these lines are diverging. And as I've said, they're about 1.2 degrees centigrade apart now, and that's a global average. You can also see that some events that are happening now wouldn't have happened without a human-induced climate change. So if we look at the Siberian heat and fires in 2020, these were virtually impossible in the climate pre-1900. They, they, they wouldn't have happened without human-induced climate change. So we can say with confidence that human-induced climate change is indeed having effects on human uh, health and human societies more broadly now, as well as in the future. A recent study, very important study in nature climate change using data from over 730 sites in 43 countries showed that um, more than a third of the total heat deaths between 1990 and 2018 could be attributed to human induced climate change. In other words, they wouldn't have happened without um, climate change. But as you can see from the map, there's big gaps in the data. So there's no data for much of Africa and Asia. And we need to fill in those gaps because this estimate could be an underestimate. We, we just don't know because the vital registration systems in these countries are not um, robust enough to allow us to um, make credible uh, estimates. So this is probably a conservative estimate. We're also seeing um, a number of other effects. So as well as causing increased death rates amongst the elderly and so on, when you expose them to extreme heat, there are also effects on other groups, and this is one group, this is a pregnant women subsistence farmers. This is some work that's just being submitted for publication, uh, led by our PhD student Anna Bonnell working in the Gambia in West Africa, and you can see her there with her Gambian colleagues working literally in the field with pregnant women subsistence farmers to measure the extreme heat exposure that they're working under at the moment. They, of course, um, ideally you should take shelter, you could work under shady conditions. That's not actually possible for many of these women. And what worried me when I saw this data was the extreme heat exposure. So this is the wet bulb globe temperature. This is measured by this instrument here. It integrates temperature, humidity, and sun, solar radiation. 
And what you can see is that some women are already working extreme heat exposure, this orange and red here. If they were elite athletes, they would be told that they shouldn't compete above a wet bulb globe temperature of about 28. But you can see that many of them are working hard in the fields whilst they're often, whilst they're pregnant, sometimes advanced pregnancy, because they don't have any choice. They have to feed their families. So they're already at um, unacceptable levels of heat stress, and that can only get worse um, in years to come. So it raises the question of to what extent will it be possible for populations like these to adapt to greater heat. We know also that heat exposure is amplified in cities. This slide shows you how the daytime and the nighttime temperature increases over urban areas. That can be modified somewhat by green space. So green space helps to cool cities. Water to some extent as well in the, in the daytime, but in the nighttime, it, the heat is radiated. So it, it compensates for that with water. Um, but, but the green space does cool cities in the day and the nighttime. And there can be big variations between the city and the surrounding countryside, but also within cities as well, depending on the kind of services. So the surface, the road surfaces, of course, dark they, they uh, absorb the heat and then they emit it again at night and so painting buildings white for example can help to reflect some of the heat and there are big socioeconomic differences so often in poorer neighborhoods um, there's increasing heat exposure because they have less green space and that's been shown in a number of studies for example in the us and in the uk we also know that there's increasing wildfire risk to health from climate change so um, those of you working in areas where um, wildfires have occurred will be aware that these produced large amounts of air pollution this recent papers in lancet pantry health explored the impact on health of these wildfires you can see that in some parts of the world they cause extraordinarily high levels of air pollution with pm levels even over 200 which is extraordinarily high of course in parts of california parts of southeast asia for for example so big exposures of populations to wildfire smoke which we believe is more toxic then your kind of average urban particulate air pollution uh, has a lot more oxi oxidative and pro-inflammatory components and causes an increase in mortality and death rates, as you can see, for several days following exposure to this wildfire smoke, as shown in a recent paper led by my colleagues um, uh, Antonio Gasparini and Ana Becerra Cabrera, um, looking at data again from a whole range of different sites. So wildfires, again, an important risk to yes, human yes. health, not just to physical health, but also mental health as well. We also know that infectious diseases are changing. So these are the um, effects of climate change, which we've already seen, already observed on the two um, vectors of dengue, Aedes in Egypti and Aedes albopictus. And you can see how their vectorial capacity, their ability to transmit dengue has increased over recent years. This is a mathematical models of their, their vectorial capacity. And you can see how it's changed since um, the middle late of the last late um, years of the last century, how it's increased steadily for these two different disease uh, vectors. So they're increasingly able to transmit um, transmit dengue um, around the world. And that's responsible probably for some of the increases in dengue that we've seen. But it's not just the infections that we know about. There may also be some nasty surprises. This is a uh, there have been a couple of work workshops and also a recent paper in nature, nature climate change suggesting that as the permafrost melt there could be a number of emerging threats to health so these microorganisms called methuselah microorganisms they uh, have adaptations that enable them to survive for many millennia in permafrost as you melt the permafrost these organisms may be released we don't know what the impacts for human health are we don't fully understand what these organisms could really do we know that some uh, organisms that are dangerous to human health, like Clostridia and so on, could be released. Also, as radioactive waste, toxins like mercury uh, and so on could also be released as the permafrost melts. So these are just examples of some nasty surprises that may be ahead. We know that climate change affects not just physical health, but also mental health. There are common increases in common mental disorders. Um, and there's this condition called solastalgia, which is the kind of grief due to environmental change when people see their familiar environments changing around them. 
Uh, and for example, Arctic populations that are forced to move their villages because of melting ice, or farmers that lose their livelihoods due to increasing droughts. And there've been a couple of reports just recently shown here on mental health and climate change, They're both useful summaries of the state of knowledge, but they do also emphasize the potential benefits of climate action for mental health. So we know that many young people are experiencing climate anxiety, and that could be seen as a rational response to an uncertain and risky future. But these, both of these reports raise the, po the point, the important potential benefits of getting involved in climate action, which I'll mention in just a moment. These may have benefits for physical and for mental health. So it's important for those of you working on the front lines in populations affected by extreme events to realize these mental health effects, but also we need to capitalize on the benefits of action. So where are we now uh, after COP26? Well, COP26 was a mixed picture, wasn't it? I mean, there were some advances. We saw coal mentioned for the first time. Many of us expected to see coal phase out agreed, but unfortunately the wording was changed to coal phase down, which is not sufficient. We do see for the first time acknowledgement of methane uh, as a short lived climate pollutant, and so the importance of cutting methane quickly. So that's a positive thing. We did see um, a lot of um, mobilization of the world community, uh, a lot of um, mobilization of NGOs around climate and health to a greater extent than we've seen in the past. And the health community was better represented, but health was still not at the center of the climate change negotiations. So in terms of where we're going, well, um, we've already experienced 1.2 degrees warming, as I've said, or heating, we might say. If we're very optimistic, we could get to 1.8. And remember the Paris Agreement says 1.5, or that's the preferable option, the preferable target. But if not, then well below two degrees. So we could still get there, but um, the real world action based on current policies takes us well above two degrees. And the full implementation of the targets embodied in these nationally determined contributions, which the countries have to have to submit under the Paris Agreement takes us to about two and a half degrees. So we're still well short of where we want to be, but it's still feasible at least to keep us below two degrees if we act um, promptly and if we build on that some of the um, contributions of COP26 as we move towards COP27 um, in, in Cairo. So these are the steps that need to be taken for a 1.5 degree world. I won't read them all out, but you can see that we need no we mustn't have any new coal power plants. We stopped selling fossil fuel powered cars before 2035. Have to include aviation and shipping. We need to stop deforestation, move towards best practice in agriculture. Remember food and agriculture, 30% of emissions. And we need to have all new buildings, zero emissions for 2020. Well, that's clearly not happening. So that gives you some idea of the really uh, the step up that we need in order to reach 1.5. We need to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions by 7% every year in order to keep to 1.5 degrees. So that's going to be very, very tough, very difficult. So in the light of all this, we need to build uh, climate resilience. We need to both adapt to those changes we can't prevent, but also cut emissions. So we need to take actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change by moving towards sustainable transportation, clean energy um, and adaptation, which means better flood protection, better infrastructure, better disaster management, more resilient healthcare systems. These two communities often don't work together. And increasingly, we need to integrate mitigation and adaptation. So for example, if you just adapt, if you just put, say, put in air conditioning, you increase demands for energy, increase burning of fossil fuels, increase air pollution, but you also have to put the heat somewhere. So you pump it outside and that means your cities outdoors will be hotter. So we actually need to have policies that synergize between mitigation and adaptation. Climate resilient health systems will require action to all these different building blocks of health systems summarized in this slide. The health work workforce will need to become more aware of climate change. We need to reduce the vulnerability of our vulnerable populations, the elderly, those living in poor housing, for example, those who suffer food poverty. We need to ensure that essential 
Medical products and technologies can be provided at lower environmental footprint through robust uh, supply chains. And we need to ensure that our health systems can uh, withstand floods, droughts, extreme heat, for example. And the health financing needs to be linked to that. And at the moment, very limited amounts of climate financing actually devoted to health. So the health sector is not being funded through the climate financing. And the climate financing, by the way, is not enough. So the countries said they would give 100 billion, but they haven't done so, particularly the donor countries. So this just gives you one example of how we can respond to climate change. This is about heat, heat action plans, a, 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 Lancet, a very recent Lancet article. And this shows you how the health sector needs to lead responses to extreme heat. There needs to be increased surveillance and early warning systems here, uh, working with the meteorological community. We need to have community response plans with cooling centers, distribution of clean water, targeting of vulnerable groups like the elderly, people living in informal settlements, uh, refugee camps, even sporting events, for example, which can put people at high risk of heat, uh, heat stress and heat strain. And it, Successful strategies will involve integrating individual interventions, buildings, so having cooler buildings with green roofs or shutters to prevent ingress of extreme heat, and landscape and urban strategies like planting, having more green space in cities. And it's by combining these different approaches uh, we can have uh, the most effective adaptation systems. But there will be, of course, limits to those systems. But there's also big benefits to human health as we move towards a net zero carbon economy. So, for example, as we move towards renewable energy, we stop producing air pollutants from fossil fuels. We think about 3.6 million premature deaths a year are due to fossil fuel burning, the air pollution from fossil fuel burning. So, uh, and also there are many other deaths from, from household air pollution, from burning solid fuels in houses, about 7 million uh, deaths altogether, about 20% due to pneumonia, 20% stroke, 34% from heart disease, 19% from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and a, and a small portion from lung cancer. So when you see patients at high risk or suffering from these diseases, one also needs to think about whether air pollution is contributing and what you can do to reduce exposure to uh, air pollution, including, of course, moving towards a, a clean, low carbon economy. The food system, as I've said, a major contributor to climate change, about 30% of emissions. And the Lancet, the Eat Lancet Commission some years ago proposed this uh, diet, the planetary health diet, they called it, which would, um, if it was taken up, uh, would um, create a sustainable food production system, uh, reducing greenhouse gases, reducing water demands and demands for fertilizer, could prevent, according to their estimates, perhaps 10 to 11 million premature adult deaths a year and lead to a sustainable food system by mid-century. So this diet, some people were, found it controversial. It's proposed reductions in uh, animal products, particularly red meat, which of course is responsible for a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, but also adverse effects on health. But also, and importantly, increases in the consumption of fruit, vegetables, whole grain, um, carbohydrates and so on, cereals and so on. So it did involve substantial dietary change one limitation, of course, is whether this diet can be afforded. And we know that many people around the world can't afford sufficient fruit and vegetables. So that needs to be addressed. But certainly when you're talking to patients, you can emphasize both the health and the environmental benefits of consuming more fruit and vegetables and in high consuming populations, cutting red meat. A lot that can be done with cities, a lot of action at the subnational level and uh, primary care professionals, of course, in many cases uh, can work with local governments to accelerate some of these changes uh, using the health argument, accessible and efficient public transport and active travel, walking and cycling. We know many people, many of your patients do not take enough physical activity. So if we can get safer walking and cycling, that will help to reduce the risk of conditions like diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and so on, reduce also the risks of obesity. Um, and using public transport, of course, is much preferable than dependence on the primary car, uh, private car. Universal access to clean, low carbon energy, I've already mentioned. Safe access to green spaces can improve mental and physical health. And of course, more resilient housing and energy efficient, better access to water and sanitation. These are all actions that can be implemented at the city level, local community level. Nature-based solutions, uh, we're recognizing they're increasingly important, not as an alternative to cutting out fossil fuels, but as an 
and they can provide perhaps one third of the cost effective climate mitigation by so intact forest, for example, take up carbon dioxide. And uh, there are a range of different nature based solutions from minimal intervention, keeping ecosystems intact, moderate interventions such as agroforestry and extensive interventions such as new ecosystems. So, for example, green roofs would be one example of those. But it's really important in implementing these nature based solutions that they're done not imposed on local communities, but done with the full engagement and consent of indigenous peoples, for example, who are often the custodians of these um, spaces, uh, forests uh, and other uh, intact ecosystems, <coughs> benefiting society in a fair and equitable way, maintaining biological and cultural diversity and contributing to the achievement of many of the sustainable development goals. So they can be beneficial, but how they're implemented is going to be important and they're not alternatives to cutting fossil fuel um, emissions. We're also recognizing that carbon emissions from healthcare are a really important contributor. So if the global healthcare sector was a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter on the planet. We know that from the work of Healthcare Without Harm, contributing to four to 5% of greenhouse gas emissions. And in some countries like the US, it's closer to 10%. So where do these emissions come from? Well, this is the carbon footprint of the National Health Service in England. You can see that more than half of these emissions actually come from the supply chain medicines, medical equipment and other supply chain issues. Some of it comes from, of course, energy in, in buildings. Some comes from anaesthetic gases like desflurane or metered dose inhalers, which are climate active. And so some of these are due to the acute sector, as shown in the right side of this slide. You can see where their contributions come from. But some comes from primary care. So, for example, the prescribing, much pharmaceutical prescribing, takes place in many countries in the, in the primary care sector. So avoiding unnecessary poly, polypharmacy, choosing low impact um, pharmaceuticals where possible, for example, powder dose asthma inhalers rather than those with propellants that contain powerful greenhouse gases. They, these can all uh, make, uh, make an impact. So there's a lot we can do through healthcare systems. The NHS in England has committed to uh, net zero emissions by 2045, even for these supply chain emissions. And we've seen at COP26, 50 countries uh, commit to uh, resilient, climate resilient, and in some places, net zero healthcare systems uh, as well. So moving uh, in conclusion to what um, Wonka is doing and what you can do, you'll be aware that uh, Wonka has been a leading voice really in arguing for planetary health, for the integration of health into uh, the, the, the care of natural systems. And this declaration um, summarizes many of these key, key points. We all have to learn more about the links between natural systems and, and health, respond to emerging health challenges, communicate with patients, preparing uh, practices for possible extreme events, advising patients about important co-benefits that can benefit their health, their family's health and the climate and, the, and planetary health more generally. Leading by examples, we know that healthcare professionals are the most trusted professions around the world. Be active in advocating. We've seen a lot of leadership from the healthcare professions. You may remember that representatives of 45 million health professionals wrote to the leaders um, of, the, of the G7, uh, last year, urging them to take a much more active role in climate change mitigation. And of course, there's the, there's the um, Wonka Working Party on the Environment, currently being chaired very, very effectively by Enrique Barros. And we definitely like to urge you to, to uh, take note of what they're doing. And if you feel motivated to join these activities, these are some of the educational resources that are available. The Green Am Impact for Health Toolkit from the Royal College of GPs um, here. Um, this wonderful course on planetary health for primary care uh, <coughs> launched by our colleagues in, in Brazil uh, last year with Wonka and the work done by um, uh, Alan Abelson and, and colleagues on, on the, training the trainer around air health, um, how that can benefit uh, reducing air pollution. So business as usual is not going to work because we are heading, if we're not careful, to real serious and potentially catastrophic impacts of environmental change on human health and so it's really important that the primary care sector is advocating and taking a leading role in 
moving towards transformative changes that will take us towards a much more equitable, resilient and sustainable economy and healthcare system, of course, as well, rather than merely trying to have incremental change and business as usual. So this is my last slide. It really tries to summarize the role of primary care professionals in climate action. There's an important role in mitigation, cutting emissions, both through personal example, also through professional collaboration, working with the healthcare system, also talking to patients and community groups and so on about the co-benefits. And there's an important role in adaptation and resilience as well, by ensuring that practices are more resilient to climate extremes, that our patients, our vulnerable patients, are, are counseled and protected during these extreme events, uh, and working with a range of different actors in our local community to increase the knowledge of and the awareness of the impacts of climate change on health, and also what needs to be done uh, about that. So let me leave you with a positive message. Of course, there's great threats and there are challenges ahead, but there's much that can be done. And the primary care community, Wonka has taken a leading role. The primary care community is really on the front line of this climate and environmental emergency. And uh, there's lots that can be done in primary care, integrating this with current practice. So let me leave you with that positive message. There is much to do, uh, but we uh, in primary care can play a really important leadership role in advocating and catalyzing the changes that we need to see to protect our patients, uh, our families and future generations. Thank you very much. <music>thank you so much andy that that uh, that's that's what i expected from you because over the years your uh, your work has been so consistent and so motivating to us um and i think it was again today um i would just like to point out that uh this plenary uh, the, the significance of this plenary uh, happening right now um Wonka has decided, and I want to congratulate them, to, to have, a, have a, a plenary session on planetary health. This is, this, is, uh, this is the first time that has happened. It means that the, the climate emergency that, that, that has been declared, uh, that is accepted, has been accepted by uh, the World Organization of Family Doctors, and that this issue has been elevated uh, to the point that we should have a plenary. And that's, that's very significant. And I want to congratulate Wonka and encourage uh, the, the executive of Wonka and the members who are listening and the, the broad membership of Wonka to, to take up this challenge that Andy uh, has, has, uh, has offered us, um, that has challenged us, and, and, and to move with it. There, there's lots that can be done. A um, couple of points I want to make. Um, Following on, um, my my position, I, I like I like the idea uh, in terms of of encouragement to talk about outrage and optimism. Uh, optimism, yes, we must stay we must stay positive. We 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 must be active. Uh, we must stay hopeful. But 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 mixed with that, we must stay outraged. We must use our our outrage, our anger, our our despair to motivate us. Um, and I think this is a wonderful combination. And I think we will be pushed. The young doctors uh, in Wonka, the young doctors of the world will push us, will make us respond with both outrage and optimism. Um, I want to uh, pass the, uh, the microphone to uh, Enrique, uh, who's been chairing the working party uh, over the last number of years, very, very successfully and very in, with lots of energy. In fact, with outrage and optimism, I would say, and just ask him to say a few, uh, uh, a few words, um, and then we'll open to questions uh, and comments from the audience, hopefully. Enrique. Thanks a lot, Alan, uh, and thanks for, for everyone watching. It's really a pleasure to have uh, Andy Haynes with us, uh, who's been working uh, so hard on these issues and bring his, uh, bringing his uh, family doctor experience when uh, addressing these uh, environmental changes. I also want to thank Alan for being the provost of our working party for so long and uh, making all this possible when many times we only have uh, two or three people in the room 
it seems that uh, the times are are calling for a, an environmental look for uh, uh, family doctors around the world. So I just want to make a, a few comments. Um, when we started talking about uh, planetary health as a central issue for family doctors, I remember having a meeting with President Hoey uh, at the time and uh, Andy Haynes. And uh, uh, Dr. Hoey said she was very pragmatic, which I think is a, is a very important aspect. Uh, she said, well, Enrique, yes, this is important, but uh, family doctors are already very overburdened. And I gave a lot of thought on that. And my answer was that, uh, and please, Andy and Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but my answer was that uh, basically family doctors that uh, practice the good medicine, evidence-based medicine, are already doing planetary health care because uh, we need to be highly effective, highly efficient with uh, the energy and the supplies that we have. And uh, uh, perhaps primary care can be one of the most effective ways to promote uh, uh, climate change mitigation as we reduce uh, the, the more high energy intensive uh, services from hospitalocentric uh, services, uh, as in my country in Brazil, that's quite uh, easy to see. We need to move away from a more hospitalocentric model. Uh, and uh, it's, it's one of the most important ways, ways to promote equity, health equity, as Barbara Starfield used to point out. So I think we need, be, we need to be very pragmatic. I think we need to, to make sure that the climate change uh, uh, community, uh, the, the community, the international community that fights climate change, uh, they must understand the role of primary health care, the role of universal health care, and uh, the role of family doctors in promoting mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Uh, and of course, one of the questions is, what is the role that Wonka wants to play in this? I see there's a, a major role. Uh, it seems that Glasgow COP, uh, the recent COP, I think it's uh, 26, sorry if I'm mistaken. Uh, it's seen more and more uh, a central issue of, of the central issue of health uh, for climate change. And I think that in the future, we may see uh, health as uh, perhaps one of the center issues, one of the center motivators to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So I want to leave it there. And uh, uh, I would love to, to hear some, some questions from the audience and uh, further comments from, uh, from Andy Haynes. Thanks. Thank you, Enrique. Um, I I am waiting for uh, somebody in the audience to raise their hand and and pose a question. Um, but I think uh, what I will do in in the absence is ask uh, Andy to talk a little bit more about his experience at COP twenty six um, and uh, the 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 health community and and where he thinks Wonka should fit into that uh, community. Uh, thank, thanks very much, uh, Alan. Yeah, so I, I was at COP26. I've been at a number of, of COPs now. I would say that this was the COP, the, the Conference of the Parties, at which the healthcare community was the best represented. So there were large numbers of, of healthcare professionals from many different countries. Uh, and there was, for the first time, a pavilion, a rather small pavilion, uh, compared with some of the others, but there was a pavilion run by WHO, which had a whole series of, I think, over 40 meetings on health during the uh, 10, or 10 days or so of, of the Conference of the Parties. So that was definitely very welcome. 
and much higher profile of health. There were many other health events as well outside that uh, pavilion. And also there was a conference. WHO hosted a conference off-site at Glasgow Caledonian University uh, with the Global Climate and Health Alliance and with other key players as well uh, on climate change and health. And I think that conference was certainly was available online uh, and maybe still is. So there was a lot of activity. That, that's on, on the plus side. But on the negative side, it was my impression that the health community was often talking to itself, was talking to each other. There was a lot of attempts to uh, lobby delegations to get them to include health in the final communique and to raise the profile of health, of course, in, in the nationally determined contributions in the negotiations more generally. But in the end, I think health, the word health only appeared once in the final community, if I, uh, communique, if I remember rightly. Uh, and, and that illustrates the fact that although there is a gradual appreciation that health really should be at the centre of climate change negotiations, it still hasn't penetrated to the heart of the negotiations. So there's a lot more work to be done in the run up to COP27 in Cairo, particularly working with our colleagues in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, well, in, in North Africa as well, to ensure that health is much more embedded uh, in COP27 than it was in COP26. And I think there are the two areas that we know about. Of course, climate change adaptation is going to be really important. Many of our African colleagues are very concerned about adapting to the climate change that we can't prevent, getting more climate funding, climate adaptation for health, um, much more uh, emphasis on the resilience of health systems in the face of climate change. So that's going to be important. But of course, we can't forget the, the importance of, of those high emitting nations uh, decarbonizing their economies. So rapid decarbonization, moving towards clean energy, moving towards uh, net zero um, healthcare systems uh, and so on, these other sectors that I've mentioned. So we need to push forward on these twin paths, really the adaptation and the mitigation, working in tandem, working in an integrated way together. Uh, and hopefully at COP27, we can have even more impact than we did at, at COP26 and, and health will really be seen much more at the center of discussions and negotiations. Um, I'll stop there, but I'm happy to answer um, further further questions if relevant. Uh, thank you, thanks, Andy. Um, we we do have a uh, a question from the floor, and the question is uh, wanting to know about changing prescribing habits and what family physicians can do. And I'll just pick up on the the one topic that Andy mentioned, which is is totally within our grasp right now, which is sw switching from uh, metered do dose inhalers for asthmatics and COPDs to uh, dry powdered inhalers. Um, the MDIs or the, the, the puffers that, that we prescribe every day uh, have a, a significant uh, footprint, carbon footprint, uh, which, would, which would be significantly reduced if, to, if we switched over. Uh, there's some concerns about uh, in many countries <coughs> with funding of uh, uh, dry powdered inhalers. Um, they're often not funded. They're not on, uh, on the uh, formulary. Um, so that's a problem, but that's definitely uh, easily accessible and a significant thing that, that we could do. Uh, let me ask uh, Andy, uh, and, and there, and um, I, I'm, I'm aware of articles uh, in, in recent family physician journals just about to, to be published in Australia and the UK and in Canada on this. So there's, there's, there's action, this is, this is starting, and it's, it's one thing easily within our grasp. But Andy can pick up on and, and take that, that idea and then the idea of further prescribing uh, further. Yeah, well, I'd also like to bring Enrique in as well, because, you know, he's, he's seeing on a, patients on a day to day basis. So I know he tackles these kind of issues in his consultations. But so one of the issues is, of course, um, wasted medications. And we know that many medications um, are just not taken as prescribed. So um, ensuring better adherence to medications, stopping the prescribing of unnecessary um, medications. Um, are, are important. Reducing polypharmacy, where that's uh, potentially hazardous to patients, but also damaging to the environment. Does our, do our patients always need to be on so many medications, particularly those uh, elderly people? Often adherence is a problem anyway. So looking rigorously at uh, their prescribing habits and trying to reduce unnecessary prescribing is really important. And then I think um, perhaps collectively, we should be doing more to work with the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, because we know that procurement policies are really important and certainly the NHS 
in England is going to be working with the pharmaceutical and medical equipment industries to support them in decarbonizing their supply chains. So incentivizing that kind of action through procurement policies, which would maybe bring in climate uh, impact assessments, uh, as well as kind of cost, the routine standard issues around costs of medication, which of course are, are very important. I think that could, that could be really useful. And we are seeing an increasing number of pharmaceutical companies getting interested in this area and, and working, even working collectively uh, to try to develop better standards, better metrics for measuring the environmental footprint of pharmaceuticals, but also working with their supply chains. And I was sitting uh, next to a very senior executive in a well-known pharmaceutical company, actually at a dinner in the periphery of COP26. And he informed me that that company they get their supplies from 55,000 other companies. So they have extraordinary themselves. They have extraordinary diverse supply chains. So they can't work individually with each of those companies, but they need to establish guidelines, good practice, um, support uh, for their supply chains to incentivize them to decarbonize um, uh, their, their activities. So they have a big multiplier effect potentially, and we can work with them, I think, constructively to uh, promote um, much lower environmental impact pharmaceuticals. And of course, emphasizing prevention uh, may mean that we need to less use less pharmaceuticals in, in the first place if we can get people walking, cycling, eating, reduced air pollution exposure, et cetera. But let me hand over to Enrique because he has a lot more recent experience in this than I do. Well, thanks, Andy. Uh, I guess uh, there isn't much to add, except for uh, perhaps uh, mentioning that I've been uh, successfully uh, trying to introduce uh, some, some talks with my patients about planetary health, uh, and it doesn't take long. Perhaps we can do a workshop about that uh, in the future. Uh, I would just uh, mention, uh, try to comment on the, on the, on the word that you said about uh, the health talking to each, the health sector talking to each other or to its own audience uh, in Glasgow, uh, and uh, well, that may be the case, but uh, only in Glasgow. I don't see that happening uh, around the world, and I I, I think that uh, uh, family doctors still have a long ways to 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 go to understand fully. Uh, what that represents, the threat, and what they can do. Uh, I think uh, there's a large role for the grassroots movements sparking from family doctors. And once doctors around the world understand this issue, uh, it would really spark a, a, a very powerful movement. I think that COVID uh, is, very, uh, is a very good example for what uh, the health sector can do to, to advise uh, on, I mean, even, even lockdowns, which would be, uh, I would never imagine that such things could, could exist. So uh, we should not uh, underestimate the, 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 the need to talk to ourselves. Uh, I know you're doing a great lot, Andy, but uh, uh, I think we, we cannot overemphasize this. And uh, just talking about pre prevention and uh, uh, the role of, of family doctors, again, I've been talking a lot to students about poly polypharmacy and uh, the, the Brazilian doctors look a lot to, to the US as a role model, but uh, sometimes we forget that one of the leading causes of death in the US is uh, the excess use of polypharmacy and, and medical errors. And uh, we should move more to a primary care integrated approach, uh, in, at least in Brazil and probably uh, in other developing countries as well. So again, here's a, a key role for primary care, um, avoiding polypharmacy and uh, avoiding uh, the, the footprint of uh, procurement, health procurement. So uh, if you want to comment again, or, or Alan, uh, if you have any more questions. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to pick up uh, Professor Bob Mash, uh, who's uh, at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, who's actually hired a, a lecturer in planetary health in his department uh, and a researcher. Um, 
asks the question, which I think you could you could pick up on uh, Enrique and, and Andy. Is there a difference between strengthening primary health care in Africa and building climate resilient plant, uh, planetary health care systems in sub-Saharan Africa? Which is very much in line with what you were saying. So please carry on and comment on that, Enrique, and then Andy. Oh, OK. Well, uh, I remember talking to Andy uh, perhaps in Wonka, Rio, a few years back, and we were discussing about, uh, about how this issue of climate change is central and uh, how, how we should uh, be very proactive in talking about climate change. And I remember a very important warning that uh, Andy said to me. He said, well, uh, listen, Enrique, we, we have to really understand that uh, when we talk about climate change, when we talk about planetary health, we're really talking about the core here that is uh, health equity. And I think that's, that's the main message that family doctors uh, can understand and can uh, be proactive about. So when we talk about uh, developing countries, uh, of course, that one of the most important issues to uh, make a, a better climate resilient uh, population is uh, having a strong primary health care uh, based uh, universal health system. Uh, and I see that in my practice. So a lot of vulnerable people would be, uh, would be much better off if they, if they have a family doctor, even with low resources that really uh, can help a lot uh, with blood pressure or with uh, good evidence-based uh, uh, advice, like uh, taking, uh, taking good uh, hydration when they have diarrhea. Sometimes I have patients here that are not very clear on that. So sometimes very simple advice, evidence-based advice can make a huge difference. So maybe, uh, maybe we can uh, research more on that and make more clear co-benefits for climate resilient uh, uh, populations and more uh, primary health care, stronger primary health care. Uh, Andy, would, would you like to also comment on this? Well, just very briefly, I know we're running out of time, but uh, you know, I do see that uh, developing, strengthening primary health care in sub-Saharan Africa has to be integrated with climate resilient primary health care systems, but you can't have a climate resilient health primary health care system if you don't have a functioning primary health care system. So the two need to be integrated very much. And many of the things we need to do to create greater resilience of primary health care systems to climate change are gonna be good in any event. So it's about strengthening supply chains, it's about having a resilient energy system so that you don't get disrupted by grid breakdowns of grids. So using mini grids to provide renewable energy and so on. Um, and uh, so, so many of them are kind of win-win strategies that would benefit primary care if we didn't have such a thing as climate change. Um, so integrate it rather than considering it as something separate. And then the other point, which I wanted to address because Rick Botelio asked a very important point was COP26 a cop out. So in, in the questions, he says, you know, there are more fossil fuel um, participants than almost any other uh, group at COP26. I think it's very, very important to be realistic. The, COP, the COPs are very imperfect processes. You know, they affect the kind of political structures of the world as we know it. And we know that many of the fossil fuel industry has strong vested interests and they have a lot of political power. And the, COP, the conference of the parties reflects that reality. So if you're looking for a perfect process, you won't find it at COP. But the question is, is it better to keep negotiating or not? And my view is it's an imperfect process, but we have to keep it going. We have to hold countries to account as far as we can, but we shouldn't put all our eggs, if you like, into the COP basket. In other words, we shouldn't think that the COP is gonna solve all our problems because it won't. And so what's really important is to continue much of the work that's going on at the community level, uh, it, it, from primary care professions, professionals, for example, this work around the decarbonisation of the, the health sector, reaching out to other sectors at the level of the cities, for example, working with local governments to support them in implementing policies, for cleaner transport systems, uh, clean energy and so on. These are all important. So don't abandon the COP process because it's imperfect. It certainly is imperfect. And we have to lobby for a better process 
and less of these vested interests, but we won't be able to prevent them completely from having some influence. And it's really important to supplement or complement the COP process by other activities uh, from, from the ground up, if you like, uh, working, mobilizing healthcare professionals, working with local decision makers, working with local communities and influencing, of course, our national governments. Thanks, Andy. Uh, that's, a, that's a perfect way to end. I think, I think we're running out of time. Um, I want to thank uh, Andy and Enrique and all of you um, and end with this with the note about Andy's Andy's call to to action. Um, there are imperfect sec, uh, imperfect uh, structures, but within our own countries, uh, we can organize as uh, health professionals to influence the politicians and their their commitments to their, their nationally determined uh, commitments, which they will have to review every year. So there's lots to be done within our countries. And as an international organization within Wonka, uh, organization of, of family doctors, please, please, please uh, keep your energy, keep your outrage going, keep your optimism going. And let's work together. Please be in touch with the working party and the environment. Uh, please, uh, the, the youth, the, the young doctors movements, the rural movements, uh, the education groups, uh, let's work together and, and make changes in our practices in educating the next uh, generation of doctors and in influencing the policymakers as a health community. So to end, I want to uh, thank Wonka for introducing Andy. Um, but I want to thank Andy for responding and coming and, and delivering such a, a powerful, focused and practical uh, challenge to us all. So thank you, everybody, uh, for, for attending. And uh, let's keep the good fight going. And uh, at the next Wonka International in two years time, we will be back and we will uh, see where we are. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.